and we have participants coming in. Perfect. So we're going to wait for another minute or two before we start, just to let everybody in. But as people are joining, uh, Erwin, do you know a joke? <laughs> I'm so bad at jokes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, bad jokes are still still, still jokes, right? <laughs> but everyone asked me that this is the, 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 I don't know the the tenth already during these calls or something. That people, I mean, tell a joke. I know I'm I'm not a comedian. Sorry. <laughs> no. No. All right, we have forty-four, have five participants. I think I'll left wait another another uh, minute or two to see if people are still going to join. Sure. Seems like the numbers uh, there are still people coming. Yeah, let's give it another minute and then one past four we will start. There you go. There is one pa past four. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So, over the course of the last months, we've done research into how companies deal with SharePoint and extending that to their, their, their needs. And throughout discussions that we had with the customers, we learned that everybody needs to, or everybody um, adjust the, their environment to their, their needs, right? And there are different pros and cons to that. There's different way they go around it. And we thought that that would be an interesting discussion to have with regards to why would you customize? What impact does it have? What are the different things that you have to take into account to ensure that you avoid the common issues that we see in the field and that you might have experienced our, uh, your, your, yourself? And then in the end, how can you ensure that you will not end up in this wild west of ap applications in your environment? So this is the last slide that you have seen. For the next 58 minutes, Irvin and I will be your host. We will go and be going back and forth, exchanging our experiences and try to, see, to explain to you a bit what we've learned over the, the past months. And we would really appreciate it if, if there's anything you'd like to ask, this is your chance to ask on the spot and we will try to, to answer the questions that you have, as well as bring in some of our experience and things that we have learned from the field. So with that, let me stop sharing the screen, go off the, the slides, and then we will get back to it. And then one, one more thing, there's a Q&A um, option in, in Zoom. This is really the best way to ask them because it's way easier for us to monitor than the chat. So if you have anything to ask, please put it in Q&A because it will be way easier for us to keep uh, um, track of that and ensure that we answer it live. All right, so with that, let me stop sh uh, sharing and get to it. So I guess first things first, right? Um, Irvin, we done the research regarding applications. And hmm. one thing that we've seen is everybody works with that. I mean, you've been working with SharePoint yourself for how many years now? Well, as long as you can, can remember. Close to, <laughs> wow, we have to, in the range of like 12, 13 years now. Wow, so, so would, you, would it be fair to say that Whatever there is to build or extend in Shish Airpoint, that you have done that over the, the course of years? Basically. Basically. So, like. All the right things, all the wrong things. Yeah, I mean, I've done exactly the same. I mean, I, I recall the days when I would be building public facing sites, and like one thing that is specific, very specific to public facing sites in Sharepoint is that one thing that you don't want them to be is to look like. like <laughs> Um, 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 team sets, right? So you will custom, you will basically change everything to it. And I recall like doing really the most random things around it, right? But that is a story for, for another day. Different topic. Was, yeah, exactly. What I was trying to get that, to, to get at is, why do you think people um, um, customize? Why do they build applications in SharePoint? Uh, several reasons. Um, just what you said. It doesn't look like the way they want it to look. Um, so corporate standards demand that they follow. And um, it's a website. People think of it as a website. So they address the product as a website. And, and we tried for years to say like, but you're not customizing Word. Why would you customize SharePoint? But that's not how things resonate. Um, so <clears throat> they want to 
it's, it's a website, it runs in the browser. The expectation is that people can change things that run in the browser. And um, that goes to the level that just buttons have a, need a different color. But that goes all to the level that like the completely out, completely out and, and, and navigation structure has to change because it fits better in their uh, philosophy of how an intranet should look like or how a public site should look like. Um, on top of that, that's one reason of customization. Another reason, uh, and that's the more common one, I would say, is uh, that, um, okay, the product works, cool, but they want this little next level. Right. Um, and, and then that next level is they want to customize things because they want to abstract away complexities of the product. That could, for instance, they don't want people to navigate to a document library, upload a document, approve it, et cetera. They just want a single point of upload and then does the work for them behind the scenes. Because you, can, you cannot expect that everyone in an organization is as technic, technically feasible or, or able to do skilled. things. Yeah. Skilled, that's the word I was looking for, thank you. Yeah. A skilled to do things. and. Um, so they want to abstract or hide the, the comp relatively complexity of the product. Um, so that's absolutely, I think, one of the more common ways of customizing things, um, automating tasks, um, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, so in other words, there is a, a big set of things that you can do with SharePoint already out of the, the box, but there are still specific customer needs, whether it's a widget to have on a page to show the data or to connect to something to build process or a form that are not available and these are exactly the things that that people want to add to make it more relevant to them right because in in the end it's about like they they don't want to use it for the sake of doing it right they have a business need they have specific purpose and they use it for that goal right yeah yep yeah. that's the main goal yeah so what are the different type of things people can 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 build. We talk about the branding, which is like, especially from the past, there was a big, 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 big thing. I want my internet to look like we envision that, we being the marketing or we being the comms. Uh, there are things like web parts. What are the other examples that people can build in SharePoint? Well, if you talk on-prem, if we, if we, if we, if for sure. now, forget yeah. about the cloud. On-prem, there are like so many extension points that you can go to and, and, and that brings, all kinds of other challenges with it, but you have things like timer jobs to automate tasks. You have things like event receivers, um, the workflows, um, et cetera, et cetera. And keep, there's keep, keep the, the list is basically never ending, but those are so many extension points you have in the product um, um, that for a developer makes the product very powerful, um, for an organization makes the product very complex to maintain, but, um, the challenge there is that I said, let's forget about online because online sort of like pulled the the, the, the the brakes on that one. So you cannot have all these extension points anymore. Things are changing there for the better, I think. Um, but uh, on-prem, you, there you can create to reference to the, the initial slide, this wild, wild west there uh, of, of customizations. You can completely go crazy and and and, and there's nothing stopping you from doing that effectively. And and for years, Microsoft effectively promoted that. He says, okay, the product has these extension points, these APIs, these hooks where you can hook into and do things. And, and they have been designed for you to consume. Do it, please go ahead. Um, that the story has changed over the years uh, in, in when it comes to that, um, that that's effect. Uh, should you really? go to all those um, um, ext extension points. Should you really use all those points of, of modification? Should you really build your own master pages? Should you really build your own site definitions? Because that is a very common one if you took on-prem that people build their own site definitions. If you're not familiar with what a site definition is, um, end users or administrators will see it when they go to the central administration, create a new site collection. You have these list of templates that you can pick from. There are site definitions and on-prem, you can build those yourself. And many um, uh, organizations have built those versions, those site definitions themselves. Um, and they are very difficult to maintain and they have all kinds of nasty side effects when you try to upgrade your environments, etc. But there's so many extension points on on-prem. In the cloud, the story is a bit different. Um, 
and, and we have a look back in the history that was okay now we have SharePoint online and we can go and everyone expected to be the same but just running in the cloud and it turned out not to be like that it looked the same it behaved pretty much the same but it did a lot of things not you could not extend it as much um, then for a while the story was basically um, thou shall not customize um, consume SharePoint online as it is it is a product right. for you to consume and do not modify it. Now, since a couple of years, that story is changing again because I think Microsoft realizes themselves that they that they have to is to now no, it's okay to customize. We give you points of modification, we give you endpoints, we give you APIs, we give you hooks into our system, but in a way that it becomes maintainable and manageable. Um, because that is the main issue with customizations on prem. Um, or one of the issues with customizations on-prem is, is that when you start to customize heavily, that will hit you the moment you start to upgrade. Right. Uh, the moment you want to go to the next level, to the next version of SharePoint, you will have to go through those customizations and make sure that they work. Um, by and, and that is inherent to the way customizations are being done in SharePoint on-prem, where SharePoint Online is not being affected by that. Microsoft releases a new version of SharePoint Online every week, and you don't even notice it. It's just suddenly this new feature pops up, this new functionality is being introduced. It's just, it's just popping up everywhere around you, but your solutions, your customizations, if done using the, the latest uh, and greatest technology, uh, being SPFX I'm talking about right now, they just happily continue to work. There is no issue there. You don't have to go back to these customizations, modify them, tweak them, test them against the new version. No, this is everything is just incremental and it just keeps on working. That was a very long answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it, so I guess so. The, yeah, you, you you gave me so many hooks along the way. I was like, I want to ask about that. I want to ask about that. I want to ask about that. Right. So one thing that that I've experienced myself in the last few weeks, um, Irvin and I both gave a course to few few of the customers that we have regarding, and one, one of the topics was what, what, what we used to do in the past extending the platform and what are the options available now, meaning, and one of the differences was on-premises versus cloud. And Erwin, you mentioned that like on-premises, you could have done so many different things. Like you had the event, event receivers, you had timer jobs and so on and, 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 and so on. And these aren't available in a cloud, at least not in that specific shape, but the pattern, like I want to have a scheduled job running in a cloud. You can achieve that. Just Absolutely. In, just in, in another way, right? So one of the things that we ended up talking more than we initially planned, but it just proves the point, right? It's exactly the change from, we used to do things in a specific way in the past, and now we're moving to the cloud and we, we have still the same needs, but we kind of need to find a different way of doing that because, the, because Microsoft will never, ever, ever allow us to deploy our custom code to their farms because they yep. operate it for the whole world and my code running on their farm could trip up everybody. Mm -hmm. So that is not an option. So being off the box, off the farm, we need to find different ways of doing that. And there are many options, right? Because we can run things in a cloud. There are ways of doing that. They're just not the same. Right, so so there are ways around it, and another interesting thing that you mentioned is the cycle of updates. Right, right, because as you said, right, in the past, and that is also specific things that many companies who are on premises and think about going to the cloud or are already one foot in the cloud, not always keep in mind. Right, in the past, like at some point, and that's all. That's in a way funny thing, while in reality it is really. It's like the bad joke of uh, development in SharePoint. At some point, we would advertise, we being PNP, would ad advertise uh, one of the patterns was uh, um, dom, DOM injection. Like the way to extend SharePoint if there was no specific hook was you would inject script to the page and you would do things. Yep. One thing that we didn't call out specifically is that page DOM is not an API. Like the fact that there is a div or a class or an ID on the page doesn't mean that you can attach to it because it's not an API. There is no SLA behind it, meaning it could just change. And in fact, over the course of the last few years, it did a few oh, yeah. times. And there was a big upheaval like, wow, this thing changed and there was no announcement. Well, there was no announcement because this is not an API. 
And that's a thing that not everybody keeps in mind. Like on premises, you have these specific points in time where the IT that operates the farm will say, okay, we're going to patch the farm now. We will have specific point in time. We'll have our test environment. We're going to apply the patch there. We're going to test everything as much as we can to ensure that it works as, as expected. And then once we verify that we're going to put that to production and they will do it de depending on the, the, the company and the impact of the patch, maybe every few months, every half a year or a year. If there is anything that could potentially break, you have the ability to catch it up front. In the cloud, as you say, you get an update whether you like it or not every week. The update could, could, meet, could mean nothing but it can be that things change. It can be that a div will be renamed. It can be that a uh, structure of the page will change because there's a new option that needs to accommodate that. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if you have applications that rely on DOM, you get yourself into the business of checking every single day, is it still on? Yeah. If this is not a good place to be. What I usually say is when, um, and I get that question from, from companies, um, it's like, is it okay to, for instance, create a custom master page? And, and, and is it okay to inject something in the DOM? And there's no one stopping you from doing that. There is not like a law that states uh, you shall not do that. Uh, the answer there is very simple. If you are okay with the risks you're taking, if you're okay with spending the money that it will cost you, that it will take you to fix at a very short notice, because you're probably the first one to hear if something breaks because customers, if you say you're a consultant and you inject something into DOM based on an, a certain ID of a div tag um, and that changes, they will call you and they will demand uh, pretty fast probably a solution. And if you're okay with that risk and if the customer that you're building that for is okay with the risk, I mean, there's nothing stopping you from doing it. Is it smart? That's a very different story. I don't necessarily, it's smart. So I, my yeah. smart. So I usually advise very much against it. Yeah, and, and, and I guess it is an expensive, expensive choice, right? Because it, it, it requires you to basically have that way of saying, well, things can break and when they break, it will take X amount of time for us to fix that, right? So, um, like, is this really the place where you want to be, right? But um, it's, it's an interesting thing. So you mentioned that in the past it was on premises, especially it was very, um, it was a wide, there was a range of things into which developers were, were able to hook, hook in, into and extend platform to their, their, their needs. So from your po point of view, are developers the only audience that can ex um, um, extend the environment to their needs or oh, oh, are there not. No, 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 are no, there no. Other, are this as well? There's of course the, the whole, power user group of people. People with appropriate access rights to a site collection can customize. Because for me, customization is all, not only mean code, uh, that could be an info path form, that could be a power app, that could be a flow, that could be a classic workflow, declarative workflow built through SharePoint Designer. Um, all those are customizations and, and all those customizations do affect you as, an, as a platform owner, to put it like that. Um, because there is no guarantee that an upgraded version of the SharePoint server still supports those customizations that, the, and they can be anywhere in your organization. You have no clue where they are. And also don't forget that just like for instance, Excel files, <laughs> if you have large Excel files, they are usually very business critical. So <laughs> the, the file, the Excel file itself is business critical. Those customizations made by people insights tend to become very business critical pretty fast. Um, and um, so they are part of your sort of realm that you need to take care of, your environment that you need to take care of. You need to be aware of them and you need to make sure that they continue to work or provide alternative solutions. Um, so absolutely power users are customizers too. And so now when we move to the cloud, that, that is actually even becoming stronger. Um, because if you say you roll out Office 365 of Microsoft 360 of Microsoft 365, the whole platform, you will get all these little, not even little, they're actually, big, <laughs> but all these, these, <coughs> sorry, all these tools that allow you and products and, and things that allow you to customize your experience. Power apps is huge 
it is it it is the name gives it away power apps they are very powerful you can do incredible things with them to the level that i've seen someone once build a game with it but you can do crazy things with power apps and they're very simple to build simple power apps are it's just a matter of dragging and dropping things and you can go completely crazy that you have to be at the level of a developer almost but they are very easy to to start with and suddenly that power app thing becomes a, a critical part can become a critical part of your of your whole offering um flow similar thing very easy to create an, an, a flow in microsoft flow um and, and you don't need to be a developer for that you don't need an administrator for that you just need to have your environment open enough for people to be able to create flows which is sort of by default almost there so it's 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 all these things pop up here and there. Um, Power BI, another one, create a Power BI report. It becomes very easy, very critical. It's hooked up into data from SharePoint maybe, it gets information from that. It's, it's all connected and interconnected and it's all depending on each other. Um, and you don't know where it is necessarily. All right, so what, what makes these applications created by users hard to track? Why, why is it so hard to keep track of them? Size amount and things are hidden behind credentials that you don't necessarily have access to you don't know where they are i mean we, we talk to customers where they have like tens if not hundreds of thousands of site collections you cannot expect people to just click through them and figure out what is located <laughs> where um that that won't happen it just simply won't happen um and and, and shepherd online and Microsoft 365 is just is is built and designed for these these volumes. It is it can handle that amount of data, and people use it, and and they should. They absolutely should use that. But it it also makes it a bit of a challenge to keep track of what is happening and where. So that is, I think, one of the bigger challenges there when it comes yeah, to those kind yeah. of customizations. And I guess that if if you so. The way typically we talk about applications is we see them in two ways. Right? One are the managed by, by the IT, which are packaged apps. So all the things like add-ins, SharePoint framework, WSPs, there is a package that has to be installed by admin of sorts, whether that's tenant admin, site collection admin. If you, 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 you choose to, um, to de de um, delegate the permissions for that. And then there are non-packaged applications that can be built by anybody and everybody, right? And that range from a piece of script added to the page, even things like Flow or Power App or custom action, maybe even things that you might not necessarily see in the UI, but something that is extending the mm. experience beyond what is available out of the box, right? And yep. you could even, so interesting things that we learned in our interviews is that 60% of, of companies do keep track of everything that is done by the IT. They have a catalog, and I mean, keep track, meaning, well, sure, they know of applications that are in, installed because it's an explicit admin action, but they do have a catalog, think of it like a list of this application has been built by this and this and this, in case of failure, contact this person, right? So they keep track of that. So six out of 10 do that. Hmm. Well, well, what is interesting though, is that nobody, we haven't encountered a single company that would keep track of applications that are created by users. Why? Because it's almost impossible. Like if you think about it, think in the scope of a whole environment, right? The other day, we ran analysis at Rancor of a enterprise grade environment. And it turned out to be a pretty big environment. I think we got something like 500 gig of, of data. And, and with that, we mean data that we picked up, not the files. So we're not talking about 500 gig of, of files, but 500 gig of data that we collected regarding applications. Mm -hmm. And I think we found something like a few thousand apps spread over tens of thousands of sites. And we discovered pretty um, many things in, the, in, in there, right? So at that scale, like it's really, it's really, really, really hard to keep track of what applications are done by whom, what impact do they have, if any, are there any issues and so forth and so on, right? So I think it's, there's also an interesting thing, right? So we established that everybody extends their environment to their needs and that's, that makes perfect sense. 
because you need that in order for the for using the environment to make sense to offer you you the value you wanted to you have to tailor it to your exact needs right because no company is alike so we established that, that everybody would change that to their needs we established that there are different audiences like the it and the users who do that because it just simply does not scale to cater to every single need across a, a company like there are things that are core business and there are things that users needs to do but it's not as uh critical the one thing that we didn't talk about it yet like what kind of issues could uh, occur from these applications that are built either by IT or users? Do you, do you have some examples based on Most your obvious, obvious, well, flow, take flow, extremely powerful. Flow can access, can be triggered the moment a document has been created. Um, with appropriate access rights within the environment, you can do anything with the document effectively, including emailing it somewhere. And where is that email going? Mm -hmm. um, that is the designer of the flow that decides that. But if you allow people, actually, that is one of the risks, for instance, there is or challenges you have with flow. Um, to, to take it a step back, you see um, companies that decide, okay, we, we recognize these risks and these issues. You know what we're going to do? We're going to lock it down. Right. We're not allowed, we completely lock down everything. Problem with that is, is that that might work from a platform perspective, but it doesn't work from a business perspective because what the people are do, they will find their way around it. And what they will do, they will start to use different environments. So there you have to make the choice then, okay, what do I do? Lock it down and I'm okay with if they go to like Box or Dropbox to store files or whatever other technology they want to use to do workflows or whatever, um, if this, then that. Um, or I allow them to create this environment with the potential risk that I don't know what's going on, but there is an option for me to dive into that information. There would be, given the fact that I own this platform, or at least you pay for it, you have API access to that environment, you, you could get insights into what's happening there. I would opt for that um, a solution to say, okay, you know what? I'm allowing them to create flows. I am allowing them to do power apps and I'm okay with that. And are you sure I don't have access to it? I don't know where it is yet, but at least it is within an environment that I can control. Right. Then having it completely outside of your organization and you don't know where all those documents are going or where all the data is stored. Um, right, because if, if you think about that, right? So I think that is also so an interesting point. As you say, if you lock it down, what we see a lot as well is people will, it's not like people will say like, okay, so it's locked down, so I will not solve my problem anymore because I I cannot know. They will go go elsewhere where they can do it. And oftentimes that is outside of the perimeter of, of, of the IT. And at that yeah. point, it's off, right? You cannot do anything about that. Yeah. Then there's another, another extreme, open up everything and allow everybody to do their thing. And in a way, it's not ideal either, but it allows you to, like, if, if you choose that, it at least allows you to do something about it over time because people are still in. People are still inside, they're working still on the platform that IT could manage and control but maybe they are not doing that that initially due to reasons such as scale complexity or anything alike. Another thing in the same story here is support. So say you lock down everything and people start to use other platforms to, to pull off their day-to-day -day business tasks and they have an issue with it. <clears throat> um, not everyone especially if you like enterprise, thousands and thousands and thousands of people working in that organization know what is supported and what is not supported. Right. So they start to use whatever platform to do things and they have an issue. Who did we call? Help desk. Help desk is like, do we support this? Do we need, do we? Do I, we even know about it? Like, what is, is this? Where's it coming us? from? Yeah, yeah. Is, 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 did we pay for, um, 
<laughs> so you don't know what to do then as an yeah, as yeah. an as a support organization. Do you need to like help them? And then what you see typically, especially if it's like higher up in the ranks, is like, uh, well, I don't care if you support it or not. I want you to fix it. Yes. And, and you start as an organization, as a support organization, you start to spend time and money on fixing issues on a platform that you're not even supporting. Um, so I would seriously opt, uh, like, okay, allow them to use these things and, and, and work on a future where you can sort of have control, have governance in place where you uh, can do things. Actually, on the, I'm looking on the side screen here. There's actually quite some questions popping up. Mm -hmm. Some of them are pretty technical. Yeah. Um, yeah um, I, th I think there's one that we should uh, pick one that is really interesting is that, so in classic, right? In classic, one of the things that we used to do was to embed scripts on pages. Like mm -hmm. there's like really, you could even say the one of number one type of things that non-developer audience could do. And, and that's actually both for developer and non-developer. Like I think the common denominator there is, it didn't require deployment by an admin. So especially over, especially over the last few years, because that wasn't the case in 2007, but if you think about, especially over the last few years, with the, ri the rise of single page apps and things like Angular, you could, like using client side code that runs in browser, you could build really compelling solutions. And all you needed to do for that is the ability to edit page, drop a web part. Hmm. Nothing else, like there is no admin control. And that's actually an interesting thing. Like, like one of the uh, stories that we heard from um, uh, during our interviews was an interesting case where once in a while, the whole farm would basically die. It would be impossible for anybody to work at. It would just go, go down. It would be like so painfully slow that, that requests would just, I, 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 I'm out. And it was like, nobody knew why. And then they would try to um, investigate things, try to find out, okay, what, what's causing that? So they would be looking at things like logging and ULS because it was on-prem. On so they would try to dig through all of that, all that. Like, eventually, they found out that somewhere, someone, once in the back, uh, in the days, they've built an application in Angular. And that application was meant for a non-technical assistant to grant permissions to a set of users. As the environment grew over time, uh, the number of people would expand too, right? So at some point, pressing a button would mean assigning 500 ACLs and across a number of sites to everybody. That's not at all. But by itself, you could think like, well, do you really want to do like from client side code running in browser? Do you really want to go to iterate over 500? hundred echoes and then assign that to users, but that isn't all. In combination with a custom claims provider that they had on in place, it was just too many requests going to AD and the whole thing would just shut down. So basically wow. the pie between the farm and AD was clogged and nothing could go through. And all of that came from, in the end, it turned out that the application had two modes, the initial fill in and then update but the person who operated the application never got, got instructions. So the person was always using the initial fill, meaning applying to everybody as opposite to just doing an update. Wow. But all of that is coming down from somebody somewhere and the IT didn't know about it because there was not an IT sanctioned application. Somebody in the business one day had a need, they hired somebody else to build it for them, deploy it on their, their pages, their sites, and that would then bring out the whole farm. Wow, it's a good story. Yeah, and, and that's and, coming down from, so yes, we used to do that in class and we still can do that in classic. Like embedding mm -hmm. script in classic was the thing that, that we would do. Now, nowadays, when you, when you think about it in uh, 2019 and, and in a cloud, we have the notion of, of modern experiences. So modern sites, they are responsive, work on a the phone, they are better, more flexible, look better as well. They just feel fresh and more I, I, I'd wait. One, and, and there are many things that we used to do in the past in classic that are not there in modern. 
at least not in a shape that we used to do them, right? And one of the things that we used to do and we cannot do in modern, at least not out of the box, is embedding scripts on pages. Why? Because things change. And eventually we experience, like some of us experience it firsthand, embedding scripts on pages is powerful, but more than often it leads to issues. Mm. So that's something that we don't want to get back to, to that place. But some people still have the pattern, the uh, thought model of we want to be doing that in modern. And technically speaking, you can. Like by the default, all modern sites are no script sites, meaning you cannot physically embed a script on a page. You can disable that, meaning you can empower users to do that. But then you basically are going back in time to the place where people can do it and they can embed scripts. And Ervin, do you, do you have a few examples like why, except from the scenario that I just described, like why, what, what, what other risks are involved with embedding external scripts on pages? Oh, there's, 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 I can come up with so many scenarios there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, first of all, you have no control of what's happening there. And keep in mind that all the code, if you have a script on the page, the JavaScript page, that JavaScript